the morgue and the blank page, which probably doesn't need much introduction, but what we will be having here is an open forum to discuss off writing habits and ways of approaching here. getting the job done. Have a seat, I'll stand. No, no, no. Okay. All good. I'm first aiding that. Well, I just want to introduce our office before we get started. Over here on the right, very appreciately gave us a seat. Excellent. You guys want one? Yeah, no, no, so we're, we're, we're good. We're good. Okay. We're good. <laughs> well, honestly, honestly, if I sit down, I can't see past the first row, so I need to stand. Well, I'm with that. <laughs> well, I'm with that. <laughs> you want a chair? Hey, if you want a chair, we got yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Just in case you can look, 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 stand, stand if you want. See, I'm committed now. You are. You don't have to stand if you don't. Okay. Well, I need to stand there. <laughs> Right. And that's what you do, you have to make your audience oh, like a <laughs> Now that I have a $50. Now that everyone wants to know. Let me first introduce our Kyle Hanna. He is the author of Military Short Stories, The Tri System of Authority Trilogy, The Time Assassin's Trilogy, and the novel The Age and the And then next we have Les Johnson, who is a physicist and author of Principal investigator for the Near Earth Asteroid Scout Solar Shell Mission at the NASA George C. Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. It's hard to explain without using all the words. You can't see physicists. No, but I was fine. We'll see you guys later. Les' latest novel, Mission to Methany, was published in February 2018 by Bain Books. He is also the author of multiple popular science nonfiction books. Recently released. Graphene. Graphene, thank you. It's the material that's going to change the world, trust me. It's an amazing stuff. The book came out in February. Okay. It's called Graphene, it's a strong superman and super versatile material that will revolutionize. It's going to change everything. We have Seth Seth, who was born and raised in Oxford, Tennessee, and has been a singer, songwriter, and has written for Kitty.com. Her pet passions have always been drawn to the internet and the fantastic, leading her to write the chemistry trilogy and beyond. And last but not least is Edward Horn, who is a reader, writer, and YouTube content creator who has worked in every facet of the publishing industry, from editing, to cover design, to writing, and criticism for the past 15 years. He has been writing professionally since 2011, and his most recent novel, The Betting of Boys, is due out August 18th. And so, what I would ask y'all first is just, if you could, in brief, walk us through a day in the life of being a writer. Okay. Um, I get up every morning about 5, 6 o'clock, and that's naturally, I don't set an alarm or anything. I get up, um, I have my coffee, I watch a show, Good Mental Morning, I don't know if anybody else watches it, it's on YouTube. Um, after that's done, and my coffee's done, and I feel like I can get out of bed, <laughs> um, I check out the office, which is outside outside of my actual house. It's, a, it's like a shed that I converted into an office. Um, and I sit out there anywhere between one to six hours writing, and that's all I do. No internet, um, no family interaction, no friend interaction, nothing. Okay, well, my day starts at 5 a.m. I go to the rec center, I swim three laps, and then I do my dives off the high dive diving board because I love the water. Water really gets me going, really gets me motivated. So when I get in contact with the water, I'm ready to go. So I leave there around 10 o'clock. I've been there that long. I have classes, and it's pretty good. I love it. I go home. I have two grandbabies I have to deal with. Okay, right now I'm on hiatus. I've done all the writing that I'm going to do for the next six months, then I'm going to get back into that. Um, in the chemistry, it's really, it's science fiction meets fiction. Because today, you don't know what's fiction and what's non-fiction. Everything is so intertwined that you could be living in fiction, okay? So, that's my day, basically. Like I said, I'm on my ass. When I was writing constantly, I would get up after my swim from home, and I was writing for about three hours, you know, because sometimes the mind, my mind gets so full of everything I want to write, I have to take a break. So I wait till the next day, and I do the same thing. I don't write over three hours a day, and that is it. 
Well, first thing I'll say is if I had to become a full, if I were being a full-time writer instead of in my day job, I would be eating dog food. Um, because I, 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 my books aren't selling quite that well. Uh, but they, they do fine. I mean, that's not the thing to sell. It's just not enough to sustain myself. And I love my day job. I, mean, I, I work on a stuff for space. But I'll tell you, that's been my enemy as, as a writer because I've had a very demanding, very busy schedule, very busy day. And but fortunately, I travel a lot for my job. And what I find is I do bursts of writing on airplanes and in hotel rooms. And so for me at home, it's almost impossible to write unless my wife's gone, uh, the kids aren't home, it's deserted. Uh, if it's, it, I'll tell you, the best days are rainy days. Uh, if it's a rainy morning and my work schedule is not too demanding, I might actually take a few hours of vacation. And that would be one of my most productive writing days. Uh, but typically, most of what I write is fit into my spare time. And, and if you're wanting to be a writer, chances are you're having to do something else to earn your money and your day job, and you're having to fit this in where you have uh, time. And I would love to tell you I get up at 5 a.m. and write. I wake up at 6 and go to work, right? Um, but I would say that, that when I do write, I am incredibly productive. And one of the things I found in terms of finding time to write was looking at how you spend your time. And if you think of time as money, and you, you do a budget and how you spend it, you'd be surprised how much of it you don't spend productively. That's just my opinion. I don't know you individually, I'm speaking generally. And I found I had a lot of time that was not productive. And so uh, I didn't buy downtown like anybody else. I'm going to binge on some Netflix shows. But for me, why waste all that time flying from here to JPL? Right? I mean, that's four to six hours in airports and on the plane. Oh my goodness. You know, no distractions, you just kind of tune out what's there and you can write. Hotel rooms, mm -hmm. I can write. So a day in the life for me is not consistent, it's sporadic, and I fit in the writing whenever I have to And I'm more along those lines. I retired from the military in 2015 and actually took a year off. And I would spend all the morning writing and then in the afternoons, jump on a bike, go swim, go hike, binge Netflix, whatever. Now that I've gone back to work, it's very similar. I try to set aside a couple of hours because I, and I'm sure we'll get to it later, and I'll tell you my, my goals of, of how I write. But I pick a couple of hours, sometime during the day, and I'll, you know, I'll jot it down. Well, um, obviously one of the things that come up is for most people, you don't live in a time where um, patronage is not a thing. In the traditional sense, you don't have rich benefactors. But we're looking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you want to sponsor yeah, me. I'm not available. Apparently, you only have to do a couple of times a day. For sponsorship, I will put you as a character in the book. I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to go and say you're going to die. <laughs> Guarantee that. But I, you know, I think that's one thing, again, we all spoke about it a little bit, but it's one thing I hear again and again from people who are on the point of be a writer and work to it is finding that balance and finding the time to do it. And um, <coughs> I guess, is there, is there, other, is there ways beyond just you know, you can't walk in the other way, but you help um, psych yourself up or like ways of approaching it that can be somehow transferable. To the way you How many of you are trying to write a book or want to write a book? Okay. I'm shocked. <laughs> 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 right. Three pieces of advice. Okay. Write. Oh, yeah. Re read, read your genre, and write. But I want you to look at it like this, okay? After you've got all your storylines and, and you've got all your little plot twists, and you're like, oh man, you're going to love this, right? Set your goal. I want to write 80, 90,000 words. I want a 90,000 word book. Yeah, I can do this. Set aside whatever it takes, an hour, two hours, three hours, whatever it is, and write a thousand words a day. Now think about that, a thousand words. In 90 days, your book is done. Set that goal. <coughs> As you write, you're going to get faster, 
and every, you know, your words are going to become clear. The more, it's, it's like exercise. If you want to be a runner, you run. If you want to be a swimmer, you swim. If you want to be a writer, you write. You get better at it. But if you set that goal, I'm going to do 1,000 words a day. I'm going to do 2,000 words a day. I'm going to do 500 words a day. Typical page is 300 words. Do, you, do 500, do 1,000 words a day. In 90 days, your book is done. And the next year, you're up here instead of up there. <coughs> set, your, set that goal. When I was a child, I was a precocious kid. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> My mother was like, seven. And I'm like, why? Where? Who? How? And what? Those were my questions. So when I write, those are the questions that I ask myself when it comes to a story. You got to ask those things to yourself to establish what type of book that you want to write and your characters and the situation. Who, what, why, how, and where. And that will help you set up your book as well. Just remember those five things. And I always got my answers. And then when I started writing, I asked myself those questions. And I was always a metaphysical type of person. But when I was small, I couldn't be no more than two or three years old. And this was a time, I am 64 years old. And this was a time when <laughs> everything was standard. And I hadn't started school yet, and my mother would always uh, prepare me to take a nap in the afternoon. So I'm laying in the bed, and I can remember this really well. When I woke up, my body was in the corner of the room, looking down at myself in the bed. I remember just as plain as day. So that prompted me into getting into the metaphysical aspects of life. And it is there. There is an etheric realm and there is a reality realm. The Matrix, Terminator, all those things, we're living those today. Even though we don't see them, we're living them today. And with the who, what, why, how, and where, if you're into science fiction, then that's what you're going to ask yourself when writing your story. With me, uh, the the most important thing for me, like I said at the beginning, is routine. I mean, if you're going to do this now, if, if people like you, you don't really have a routine. You get in, you get in where you, you can fit in. It. With me, I can't do that. I have to have some kind of routine, some kind of daily schedule every single day. And if I break that schedule, I actually feel that. So that's even more motivation. It's almost like an addiction. You get to do it every single day. You get in the habit of doing it. That way, when you don't do it, you feel bad. It's just like any other addiction. And when you build it, you're talking about the more you do it, the better you get at it, and the easier those words come. Mm -hmm. Another thing he touched on was read uh, read your genre, but I would say also read outside of your genre. Um, there should be aspects. Any good book has all of the genres in it, um, all aspects. Of course, you want one central theme like sci-fi or horror or romance or whatever, but you want to add little elements of each one, you know, drama, conflict humor, all that stuff, so it makes an entertaining story. Well, when it comes to writing, um, another question I often hear you is uh, balancing um, plotting and storyboarding and I guess you know, what you think the story is going to be about and how it's going to work versus what actually happens when you put down. So, could y'all speak to that some in terms of how y'all handle plotting? <coughs> Well, I, I learned uh, my, my first fiction books were collaboration. Uh, Mission to Metany is actually my fourth novel, but it's the first solo novel. The other novels I've written with books. I, uh, I wrote a two book series with uh, Travis Taylor. If you've ever seen the Rocket Super Red Max, he's a crazy man. Okay. Um, really smart guy, really good friend of mine. And we were both, uh, he's an engineer, I'm a scientist, so you might imagine that we plot our novels. So we know basically the story arc by the time we start writing, we write it up what the are going to write, how we're going to tie it together. And the characters don't always go along with what you think you're going to do because these people become real. And so sometimes they do things you can count on and you're working with a co-author, you 
to say, is it okay? You know, and, and you do that. But generally speaking, you plot it out. Well, after I uh, had uh, I did a plug in anthology, I was actually contacted by one of my idols, uh, Ben Bova. Uh, you know, uh, and he actually, yeah, yeah, he read one of my short stories and wrote my publisher came in and said, hey, "Les would write a novel with me." I mean, come on, like who are you kidding? You can quit your day job. No, no not, yeah, <laughs> but you did very well, but not not well enough to quit my day job. But um, so I actually wrote a book with Ben. But Ben was very different. I was ready to sit down and plot the whole thing out with Ben. And he's what's called a pantser. Mm -hmm. He writes from the seat of his pants. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. You're going to collaborate. I have this big idea. It's going to be a Mars mission, and something goes wrong on the world. Go. Yeah. <laughs> that was what it was. He said, why don't you get something started, and we'll go from there. And it was like that. Right? Okay. And so uh, basically, I wrote that book. And, and, but before I did, I went and reread some of my favorite Mars books that he had written. And I also wrote a book he wrote called How to Write Science Fiction That Sells. Because I thought writing with him as a co author, he's like Ben Bova, right? <laughs> I want to make sure that my writing style is compatible with this. So I actually had to alter a little bit of how I write. But um, so I ended up working that way with him. So for me, I back to when I came back to writing this book, I plotted it out because I'm a lot more comfortable with a plot and knowing what's going to happen, generally speaking, from beginning to end. But again, as you get into it, things diverge. And, and things that you didn't expect happening happen. For instance, my uh, my lead character in the book, as I as I was writing it, I realized he was on the opposite spectrum. And, and when I realized that, I thought, okay, I'm not going to flee from that. I'm going to embrace it. Uh, and so I ended up. So that that's what became. That's what I realized is my protagonist was on the opposite spectrum. And I didn't even realize it when I was writing. So he came along. He came along in the story. And so. I'm a little bit of. Both actually, I, I try to plot it out, especially when you're dealing with historical type stuff. History's there, but getting my assassins back there and tweaking all that. When you figure out how to get them back in time, you come see me. We'll talk about that. Um, me and my business partner, we got that figured out. Anyway, um, but no, I, I do try to plot it, but like like I said, once the characters take over. They're going to go over here because it's what they want to go do. They want to go for a swim or whatever. And then they want to come back over here. And eventually they'll come back back to the story. But let your characters let your characters go. And one thing I found on this one, one of the subplots in this is a lot of presidential stuff, like uh, presidential assassination. And I was trying to figure out how my antagonist, why he would kill <coughs> this certain president. Turns out I've already written a chapter where they fought together in the war they did war. They already had a history. I didn't know it. Until the character went, dude, I know this guy. I'll take care of it. And then he goes over here and kills the guy, you know, and I was like, cool. But those puzzle pieces, they will fit. Let your characters, let your characters go. You can always leave it on the bedroom and floor later. It, it's astounding how well things fit together. You, they, these, the stories really do write themselves. I'm a complete cancer. Everything that I've ever tried to plot in the past, I mean, ever since 2011 when I actually took this writing career seriously, everything that I've tried to plot I've not been able to finish because I lose the joy of discovery. Um, it, it, there's no, there's actually no reason for me to continue telling the story when I've written out exactly how the story is supposed to go. So whenever I write all of my rough drafts are, I, I just sit down and start writing. Where this stuff comes from, I have no idea. I still have intricate plots, and usually those are there before the rewrites. Um, so I've done very, very little as far as fixing things to make things fit around one of my most intricate tw like twist endings is a novel I wrote called Life After Dane, and that ending was there from the very first draft. I didn't have to fix it at all. Um, so I'm a firm believer, like Stephen King says, those, these stories exist, and we are unearthing these stories from somewhere. I don't know if it might be the metaphysical, like she's talking about, or what it might be, but these stories exist. Yeah. So it's like a choose your own adventure novel where the choice is unlimited. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's what they're Yeah, but that, exactly, that's what you have to do. Right. It's going to unlock it. Once you realize that you can do absolutely anything with that page, it helps a lot. Okay. There are no rules. I try to pull things out and I get all bunched up at a decision point. I, I would do yeah, just, just keep going. Just right through it. Yeah. Even if with your 
I, my, my motto is it's all practice until you publish. It's all practice. So, I, and it's okay if a novel doesn't work. It's okay if you get stuck and just write through it. It, does, it can be the, the most simple fix. It can be the most coincidental fix that you can find. The easiest thing, just blow through it. Because chances get it are you're going to be able to look in retrospect and make that better. You, you're going to write something in chapter 20 and go back to chapter 3 and go, dude, yes. And so, I, I swear, if there was ever a camera on me while I'm plotting that, you could see me go, oh, they're going to love this. Because my whole thing is plot twist. I want to keep you going, holy blankety blank blank, and flip the page. That's my job. So many people get stuck on it has to be a certain way. Like, especially, especially with plotters that I've talked to, it has to be this way. And if you don't allow some pantsing at some point in time, if you don't allow, like I said, for your characters to evolve and naturally, naturally react to situations, because when you're plotting, also you don't know how, once you build that character, that character is going to react differently than you, hopefully, if you're building a a living, you know, a living person and not just a, you know, a cardboard cut out of a character. Um, that person is going to have their own thoughts, feelings, and another aspect of it is uh, most good writers are good actors also. They, they know how to embody somebody else and they can perform those things so they can get their characters to act the way their characters should. But never get stuck. If you, if you, ever, if you ever feel writer's block coming on, I suggest taking a break and working on something else or pushing through with that and just getting it out on the page, just getting it done, because then you can go back to it. That's what first, second, third, sixteenth yeah. drafts are for. That's what, what that's what the editing process is yeah. for is to flesh all that out. But the rough draft, it just it doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to be done. Well in the chemistry, the plots in the chemistry, I had to go to the future to get back to the past. And what I did with my plots is I worked out things where you would never think that everything is interconnected. Everything in the chemistry is interconnected. And it's not hard to write it all if you know where your main character is going. If you focus on your main character, that's basically the one that would be carrying the story for me, for, for the chemistry. Um, I had to do five novels to get to the end point of where this was all leading to, plots and all. And each plot has something to do with the first or the second plot. It's, it's, it's very easy to do. And you're right, you have to be an actor. A lot of times I act out my own character. Mm -hmm. And, you need to. Oh yeah, and on my website, if you go to the HOC and the DOC, those are my hero characters and those are my demon characters. And each and every voice that you hear is my voice. I get all the voices. Uh, the main character that everybody likes is, bring that woman to me. Uh, yeah. I will make them bow down to my <laughs> There is nowhere she can hide. <laughs> so, but when you go to the website, it's a little bit. Okay, I'm just improvising. A word, a word, real quick on dialogue before we move on. You talking about reading out, you know, your scenes and everything. If you want to write realistic dialogue, the best way to do that is to actually read it out loud to yourself. Yeah. Oh, I do. Um, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's the best. Be that yeah. is good. And even your narrative, in, in one step of your editing process, should be reading your book to yourself yeah. out loud. So you trust me, you're going to catch so many more errors yeah. that way. So many more if you read. You're like, oh, I, I, what? We didn't write that. That sounds rather really stilted. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want your you want your stories to flow naturally, and the only way to tell if that's the case is either read it yourself or have somebody read it to you. Um, right. Luckily, my wife will do that for me, but I know not everybody has somebody that can do that for them. So read it yourself. Yeah, question. Um, yeah. Have you ever been writing a character all of a sudden the character tapped you on the shoulder and said, "Excuse me, I wouldn't do that." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and that's part of the editing process as you go through because, <laughs> at, at least for me. When I'm going through the rough draft, okay, I've got the scene, moving on to the next scene, moving on. And then, in the editing process, I'll add some details. And I go back through the dialogue and go, all right, this guy doesn't use contractions, and here he says can't. So, you know, you change that stuff. Or, you know, in this one, I had a character that 
was very formal and was always Mr. He never used first names. He was always Mr. Cutter or, you know, like. So once you pick on that idiosyncrasy, go back through and make sure it's consistent. Um, it's just a little name. Yeah. Like it, yeah think, of, name. think of Yoda, okay? <laughs> <laughs> go back through and try to figure out that dialogue. It, 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 it hurts the brain. <laughs> uh, but it's usually very consistent. Yeah, but it's very consistent. So, you know, that's one thing you do, your beta readers do, your editors do. Make sure, hey, the guy's got have brown eyes in chapter two and blue eyes in chapter seven. All of those things must be consistent. So, but especially the dialogue. Read it out loud and say, okay, this guy's angry. Hi, how are you? That's not angry. You know, through clenched here. You know. So make sure that it's actually conveying what you want it to convey. In some ways, that seems like you know what I'm saying is, you know, thinking of the creative process as if you're a director. Mm -hmm. yes. You are. That's you're, you're everything. You're directing that yeah. book. You're, you're, yeah. the, you're the screenwriter, the director, the lighting, the costume, the, the, the actors, all the yeah. actors, you're everyone. Mm -hmm. You're okay. the production okay. company. You can see what you are. You're getting more intimidated by the <laughs> <laughs> No animals were hard. <laughs> 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 Those poor novices gave up their hides. Yes, yes. The novices. That's not a moment of silence for the novices. Coming back to, and I think it's something that intimidates a lot of people who are wanting to be writers or still learning, is the editing process. I think that it's scary. I think it's when the realization comes that. I stopped the show and didn't just sit down, crack his knuckles, and pump no. out the great gas and beat. Right, drunk, yeah. edit, so no. no <laughs> <laughs> That's Hemingway, actually. Yeah. Um, a good editor was no editing. Editing is really important. I, I don't know about you, but have you noticed that a lot of New York Times bestseller authors, the more bestsellers they sell, the bigger and bigger the book bigger and the less tight the story gets. Yeah. And, 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 and they're, they're out, they're all out there, right? And you know what made a lot of these writers famous is they really had good editors. Exactly. Because they helped them stay on point, keep it focused. But you know, when, when some writers get really big, it's like, I'll just go to a good publisher if you edit me, and then you're stuck, right? So you get these massive books. I'll, I'll tell you that as as I've done this, I have People look at my books and give me edits, and you do grammar checkers, and you reread it yourself, and you find mistakes, and you fix it. But having somebody who is not only a, a punctuation and grammar editor, you know, you think of your favorite cousin who, you know, writes something. I'm editing. Okay. No, go ahead. go ahead. I have four stops, and some of these are doubled or triple, quadruple in the editing process. The very first thing, as soon as I finish a rough draft, I put it away for six months. That there, there's no advantage about the bat. It's put in, away for six months. I come back to it. I do a first draft. Maybe going to need a second draft before I send it to beta readers. Mm -hmm. Those beta readers are going to read it. They're not going to fix anything typographically. They're not going to fix anything. Hopefully, they can get through it. It's not too bad. Um, all they're looking for are plot holes and inconsistencies in the plot. That is it. Um, and then when that comes back, and I'm happy with it, um, maybe I send it to one last person to make sure they don't find anything. It'll come back, and I will send it to the content editor. The content editor will actually, they, not only will they look for the same thing that they, they just look for, but they will look for story structure, and they will actually go at it with a red pen and chop it up and say, this fits better here, this fits better there, that sort of thing. After that's done, it goes to the line editing. Those are the guys that go for, to make sure that uh, the everything makes sense, that my writing is as clear as possible. They fix errors, whether it be grammatical or well, whatever it might be, they're there for errors, to fix the errors. They're, they're there to chop up the manuscript also. The very last ones, very last eyes of the proofreaders, those are the ones who read the final document for little typos or whatever, but they are not to change anything big. That should have been caught already. If you are fixing sentence structure in proofreading, you're on the wrong step of the process. Um, but that's the four that I use. I don't know how you guys work. I know. Um, I'm very well, similar. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. What I was going to say, what I do is I write a chapter every two weeks. I don't need no more than that. A chapter every two weeks. And once I proofread it myself and I look at it, I'm thinking, oh, okay, it's okay. I send it out to California. I have a very good friend that writes uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the pharmaceutical 
area. And she's really good at doing um, grants, and so she's really methodical. She's got a medical book like this. So I send, it, send that out to her, and until she proves it and reads it and corrects everything for me, she'll send it back. That's my only edit that I do. Make it simple. Mm -hmm. I'm more along his lines. I'll finish the road out. I'll go through it a couple of times, adding the details. I don't necessarily put a lot of details in it during the rough draft. I'll go back and change dialogue. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll put a lot of the scenery and character details in it. Once I go through it a couple of times, it goes to the beta readers. Now I have one. There's usually three to five. Most of them, kind of like you, they're looking for plot points. And uh, I had one. One of the characters was nailing up a sign. I knew what the sign said. I never wrote it down. So I get all these, I do what the sign said. So you know, they, they look for those kind of things. I knew what it said. But I did have one of my beta readers. She goes ahead, she's finding Adam Blair, she goes, you know, don't be, don't be an ass, you know, in some pop spot. So when I get all that done, so I don't do it twice. Beta readers have gone through it. I go through it a third time. At that point, I send it to my publisher, and her editor goes through it. So at least four times, someone has gone through it. But and I'm going to differ with you just a little oh, bit. Go ahead, go ahead. Don't, and it, it works for you, obviously. It, yeah. <laughs> Don't get caught in the circle. You write a couple of uh, chapters, and then you go back and you start editing. Because it is a vicious circle, because it's never perfect. It is never going to be perfect. Finish the whole thing, and then edit the whole thing. If you get caught in that circle, it's very hard to get out of it. Anything that kills the momentum, try and stay away from it. Anything that will kill momentum. Now, it works for some people. Some people... Uh, you said you plotted like all five books at one time, right? Before you started working. But she had, for someone like me that's still discovering the book, that's not going to work. Uh, I need the whole thing done because I don't even know what's going to happen. I don't know if I'm going to have to. If that person is editing like the first few chapters, those first few chapters might not even be there in the final draft. So, uh, uh, but, but anything, like he was saying, any, anything that kills momentum, if you're, especially if you're a pantser that just sits down, you're a discovery writer, um, I, I don't suggest doing it that way. But it works for her, right? You got a question? Yes. Can we ask a question? I heard Brandon Sanderson said he got like 19 books in the row because he didn't want to edit it. Like, how do y'all, <laughs> how do y'all get over like the, you know, when you stare at one enough, you just want her and fire their Well, I have to tell you, you I'm editing an anthology for fame books right now. Uh, where I'm getting various writers who put stuff in. And editing, I, I, I really love the editing because it's hard. I actually like to do it really hard. Um, I, and, and so I can understand why you don't like editing because you're, you're, who's your own worst critic, right? Yeah. You are. You are your own worst critic. But you've got to, you've got to do it. And he, uh, Brandon Sanderson can get away with it, maybe, but not many people can. Yeah. I look at it as it's a necessary evil because I'm taking a good story and I'm making it great, whether it's mine or someone else's. If you're the writer and you send it to me to edit, my goal is to polish this thing up to make it the absolute best it can be because I want you to be successful. My, my process is it, it takes me three years to get a, a finished novel. So by the time, that's, that's the reason why I let it sit for six months. Yeah, after I'm fin finished with that rough draft, I let it sit <coughs> so I forget it and I write something else. Mm -hmm. I have a three-step process as far as the books are concerned. I always have one I'm editing. One I am writing, well, one I am actively editing, one I am actively writing, and one that I am actively ignoring. So I have one sitting <laughs> off for six months, I am editing one, and I am writing one. So my process while I'm working during the day, that one to six hours, is I'm going to write new material, then I'm going to edit old material, and then I'm going to ignore <laughs> that other book that's sitting in the drawer or wherever it might be. Well, so. with my chemistry series, I started it in 2007. And I didn't finish it until this year. So that's how long it took me to write all the five books from 2007 to 2018. It's about a year for me to write a book. 
I would say, about a year ago. It, it take, it, a rough draft, a year on the rough draft. I'm sorry? The year on the rough draft or yeah. a year? Well, pretty much a year on the first draft. It took a few months to get beyond that. So I'm, yeah. like 18 months I'm sorry, the, I, it, nine, nine days to 27 days. That's about as long as I stay on a rough draft. Um, but I'm like you. I bare bones right at first, yeah. and then I build through all the all the other things that I add. If, if, if I'm on a roll, I'll finish the novel in the rough draft of three <coughs> months, and then another three months of editing and beta reading. So I, I can. <clears throat> last year I completed three books. Last year, this, this whole series in one year. Now, granted, the first one was half done. I put it aside four years ago because it was not where I wanted it to be. Picked it up, added some stuff I wrote in high school, boom, it fit. But something you mentioned a while ago, the first couple of chapters may not even yeah. be there. Yeah. This book, the way I had envisioned it, ended up being chapter three. So the start of the book ended up being a third chapter because <coughs> I started it completely different. And the last thing I wrote on this one was the prologue. Yeah. It was missing something. So I added a five-page prologue that changed the entire dynamic of the book in five pages. And so, you know, don't get caught in the editing loop unless it works for you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> in the chemistry, yeah. the first book starts at chapter 100. It's 100 chapters. So what we're doing, we're counting backwards. That's why I had to go to the future before I could go to the past. Well, and sometimes and things also don't go the way you want them to go. Yeah. Right. Because I had a short story for a collection, and as I wrote it, it started exceeding the short story, and I realized I had a novel. <laughs> and so I had to put that aside, because I had to do the short story, and then I wrote something completely different. See, that's, that's the problem I have with like themed anthology uh, that I get invited to, or just somebody saying, hey, you, you got a story for us? Uh, I have a problem with that because I'm a pantser. I never know whether or not <laughs> that thing is going to be a short story, a fl piece of flash fiction, a short story, a novelette, a novella, a novel, a series of books. I never know what it's going to be, so I can never say that's the, one of the problems with writing the way I do is you never know how long the story is going to take. To and well, I've to put this aside, and it'll be a, it'll be a book proposal in about a year. Later. And it is so. a very different process to me, anyway, between writing a novel and a short story. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, I, ju I just edited yesterday, yeah, yesterday Friday, a friend of mine said, I'm open call for military short stories. I had one. I sent it to him, he goes, tweak it. So I spent a couple hours yesterday tweaking it and, and then resubmitting it. So we'll see how it goes. I'll spend more time editing a short story than I will with a novel. I know that sounds funny, but um, the reason for that is a short story, you only have a certain amount of time mm -hmm. and a certain amount of, it's usually word count that you're looking to hit, um, whether it be 3,000 words, 5,000 words. Um, and those, they have to be perfect. You don't have any time, you don't have any time for character development. It's got to be time. Every, single word, everything has to count, whereas a novel, you can go off on little, you know, you can meander over here for a little bit and describe this person's past from 1987 or whatever and then come back to the past. Yeah, you can do that, that, that kind of thing with a novel, but with a short story, you want to get to the point as quick as possible and get the story out. You have very little time for character development, especially if you're writing genre short, short fiction. Yes. Um, I'm thinking about something you said. It sounds like there was a time when you like had something and uh, you like read it and like, okay, this is not really working with a lot of the rest of it. No. And you sort of took it out, like you wrote, chapter two didn't go with the other chapter two, and you pulled it back. My question is, at some point where you write something, like, okay, there's something, and you go back and say, oh, that chapter two will work well in this book. Well, for this, it's a lot of history. I, since they're time travelers, I can have them go in any which way I want it. The way I had originally started with, the assassin was in his work, in a hotel room flicking through the channels watching his work on the TV going, I did that, you know, kind of thing, right? So, you know, that's the way I wanted the whole thing to start. I ended up putting it as chapter three as a case study, somebody studying what he did. Okay. You still get all the history, but it's, it's just changing the dynamic. But um, as far as, like, when I set this one aside, if you're bored with it, your reader's done it bored with. Set it aside, just like you said. You know, set it aside to start working on something else. When I came back to this one, I knew I had a, a, a decent story. It just wasn't where I wanted it to be. 
I reached back 30 years to literal crap I wrote in high school. Pulled the characters up, some of the old stories, revamped them. I got a three book series out of it for stuff I wrote 30 years ago. Because I don't throw away any. Yeah, I was going to comment on that. <laughs> I call the process cannibalism uh, in the, because what you're doing is you're repurposing material. Oh, yeah. Never throw anything away. Even if something you think is hot garbage, you want to <coughs> throw it away, set it aside. If you cut it out, you can always change character settings, any of that stuff. But if you have good material, good material is good material. That does not mean it's going to fit in the piece. It just means it's good material. So set that aside, never throw anything away. Even if it's just, just a scene. Exactly. If, if, you wake up, if you wake up from a dream and go, dude, that was awesome, you write down the scene. Five years from now, you'd be writing a book go, I need that scene. And you can file cabinet, pull it out, boom. Yep. Don't throw anything away. Yes. It'll save you. And, and you know, with everything, those of us who don't use manual typewriters, you can, it's easy to say. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> right. Until so, your computer crashes. It's easier to save my papers, too, because I just put them in the book. Yes, ma'am. Um, going back a bit from the editing process, one of the, <coughs> the, the biggest problem I have is I wall build, and then I continue. And then I continue, and then I'll start writing, and I'm like, oh, but I don't know who this person is. I have to go research them. And I don't Ooh. ever get caught in that kind of trap. Well, I, background's like, important, but it's not necessary to put all of it in the store. And it's well, not necessary to rough it's, draft. Yeah. If you want to make a note for yourself, needs research, and then move on and yes. finish it, just don't commit to anything in the book that requires that research. Because when you get to a point, and if you've written something that you are forcing that, that square <coughs> thing into a round hole, you're going to stop writing. Mm -hmm. At some point, you're going to be like, oh, I'm done. This is this is garbage. I can't do it. Well, but as, as someone who's a plotter, yeah. equally important to plotters who are the characters. Right. And yeah. so I create character sheets for the, yes. for the oh, principal right. character, yeah. tell them about their background, why they are the way they are. Mm -hmm. and, and But again, when I was writing Mission to Methodia, I had to revise that because of the way the character was. Mm -hmm. So I had to go back and add to that. Uh, but I thought it was important for me because I want to know who they are. Yeah, and that's why I get stuck. And your, your world, you know, the environment is important, okay, because how your characters interact with the environment, that could be some of your conflict or, you know, whatever else. But don't don't let it stop your process. Like you said, I, I'll go back through all the time. I'm, I'm 15 chapters into it, and I'm going, I'll go back to chapter 2 and make a note, hey, make him do this. Oh, you do that and then I go back, and I just keep going. Yeah. So when the editing process, I see my note, that's when I do the research, that's when I edit, because in chapter 25, I may go back and go, no, 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 and change it again, and again, and again, and again. I need to make a comment to that, though, because when I was doing the book uh, Rescue Mode with, with Ben Boca, I had written the characters into a corner, and I couldn't figure out how to get them out, and I, and I, I saw a way to get it out, and it would require a character to do something, someone was talking about out of character for a character, he wasn't. They would be out of character. Well, what I did is I went back and rewrote yeah, the character. Absolutely. So that it was no longer out of character because I really loved that event. And it turns out, I had somebody tell me to make them cry. But it was the, 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 that saved the story and kept it moving. But in order to get that character to have that event happen, which was this big gut wrenching moment, I had to go back and change who they were at the beginning and then rewrite the character through the story to be consistent. Your characters will evolve. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you've got it, this is my character. Yeah. It's going to stop. Yeah. Let them evolve with the story. Because remember, but sometimes the story evolves the character. Yes, yes yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. remember, you know, just like going through life, you're not the same person you were 20 years ago. Yeah. Life has changed you. Let the story change the character and vice versa. You, got, you really have to weigh on, <coughs> on stopping. Like I said, anything that kills the momentum, you want to stay away from. Um, if you know that having to research something is going to kill the momentum for that scene, if you're having fun, going back to, uh, I can't remember which one of you guys said it, uh, if you're bored, the, the reader's going to be bored, there, there you go. Um, the, you, you really need to lock on to that. Um, because if you're getting bored of the scene, but it also at the same time, if you are having a blast with the scene, nothing needs to be stopping you. Not, no character research, anything like that. Get that. Not out. dinner. Not, not nothing. kids. Nothing. nothing. You keep going. Nothing. The end of the world outside, fire and brimstone, any of that. Somebody will take care of it. That's a great point to leave them. And on. Don't be around. What? I'm sorry. 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 I'm sor
upstairs. Please come by and talk to us. What are you and, supposed to be doing book signing a little bit later on? For the rest of us, come <laughs> see us. Uh, please come see everybody else upstairs. They're upstairs and very approachable, and you can grill them all you want there. Yeah, um, please. If you stick around for a few more minutes, we're going to have another author panel meeting. Mm -hmm. Just grill them. I didn't bring Robert. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the marinade. <laughs> Seriously, if anybody has oh, any questions, oh, just come by. Stop and talk to me. Uh, oh, yeah. Yes, yes. 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 Yes.